Hi, this is Adrienne Barbeau. Just call me Billy. Everyone does. And you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. All the fire's burning bright. Funky faces in the night. I remember Halloween dead cats hanging from poles, little dead around in droves. I remember Halloween. All right, we are back. Welcome to Without Your Head Horror Radio, and we're joined by F. Paul Wilson. Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm glad to be here. How are you doing? Oh, doing fine. It's 10:15 uh, in my time here on the East Coast. Right. I think it's 10.15 for all of us here. That's actually 10.20. <laughs> oh, yeah. Stickler for uh, details there. <laughs> yeah, we don't trust any of those West Coast people. No. Let everybody know about your website right off the bat, uh, repairmanjack.com. You find out all the information about uh, books, upcoming appearances, and everything. Yeah, and there's a, there's a really active uh, forum where uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of conversation there, really interesting stuff, and a lot of good people. Mm-hmm. I really think it's a great website, but and it's not necessarily because of me, but because of all the uh, the people who participate in it. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a great one, yeah. There's always stuff going on. Then you get the newsletter too, so that'll tell you right. what's coming up and everything. Yeah, you I, can sign up for that there too. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, I got the Repairman Jack uh, movie in the works. Yes, yeah, actually, finally, after 11 or 12 years, it, it finally seems to be uh, heading toward production. Uh, they everybody they got a script that everybody likes, and they they've now um, they they send it out to, to a star, their number one choice of the star, and he wants to do it. And so it's a matter of you know the Beacon lawyers and the uh, the star's agent coming to terms uh, I think they will um, I think it's a good move for this guy I, I'm not allowed to say who he is but um, I think it'll be a, a really great move for him and I, I think he probably knows that too so I, I think they will come to a deal mm-hmm. and uh, when, when he's signed then I can I can start talking about him all right, so we won't try to uh, find out the dirt. Right now. <laughs> you can wheedle it out of me, but, you know, I'm, <laughs> I've been through this before. Let's you know. to liquor him up. we got a, we got a call here, Goosey. You're on air with that, um, Paul Wilson. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I just wanted to get his thoughts on uh, the horrible movie. I mean, I know his book was really good, but the movie of The Keep was just horrible. I just wanted to get his thoughts on it. Well, I'm in perfect agreement with you, um, and I have, I have. Okay, the movie was '83, so that makes it 24 years that I have whined about this movie, um, and because it, re- it really sucked. And and Michael Mann knows it sucked, and he doesn't uh, he doesn't mention it anymore. Um, when you Whenever he has a new movie come out, they you know they give a list of his past accomplishments, and somehow the keep is you know conspicuous by its absence. And um, he actually, I understand he submitted a three-hour cut, and uh, he'd gone so far over budget with his um, his really excessive. I mean, all right, look, um, I was at Shepard Studios watching some of the filming. And there was one scene there. It was probably three, four, at the most five seconds on screen. Whole afternoon spent take after take after take. It was. I mean, I, this is this is my book. This, they were making a movie out of my book. There was a scene right out of my book, and I was bored out of my mind. I finally <laughs> left. In contrast, you know, Pelt my short story that was made for uh, Showtime Masters yeah for of Master of Horror mm-hmm. uh, and directed by Dario Argento um, he's used to working on a low budget mm-hmm. two takes maybe three and then it's bane, bane and then we're <laughs> off to another setup and and it was so refreshing to watch <laughs> some, some actual momentum <laughs> in making 
a film. So, you know, it's a, a lot of it. You know, is indulgence. You know, and 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 man was was very you know self indulgent on, on that film, and he ran out of money, and he wanted more money for for special effects to fin you know, to finish them, and it was like a cursed movie. The the uh, Wally Beaver, the special effects guy, you know, died during production. Um, okay. So. And and Paramount said no, no more money. <laughs> Give us a, a a cut less than a hundred minutes, and we're going to go out with that. And so they knew it was going to tank. And um, guess what? It did. <laughs> yes, that's it was be a horrible, awful, awful, awful movie. movie experience, though. <laughs> well, I mean, it's yeah. I mean, Jeffrey Lyons said it best. He said, you know, it it could have been wonderful, but it fell apart under the weight of its own pretensions. And and that says it all, really. And and that that says you know, the Michael Mann experience. He's mm -hmm. just uh, pretentious. Think... Go on, Sorry. try. Oh, I, I think well, wasn't Ian McKellen in that movie? Yes, Ian McKellen. There was yeah, Scott yeah. Glenn, <laughs> Gabriel Byrne, um, Jur Jurgen Prochnow. I mean, a fabulous cast. Yeah. Yep. It should have been, as, as you said, it should have been wonderful. Yeah. And it's never even been released on a DVD. No. Apparently, Michael Mann has um, gained some kind of interest in in the film. I mean, he, w he was just a writer-director, but somewhere along the line, and maybe he bought into it or something. But if, if you want to do anything about the keep nowadays, you must go through him. And it's amazing. When, when I, I wrote the, uh, the graphic novel for the keep, and uh, that was my version of what the movie should have been like, mm -hmm. um, I got one email, phone call, whatever, after another, saying, is this, you know, is this available to be made into a film and blah, blah, blah. A lot of people didn't even know it had been. And then I said, oh, yeah, well, yes and no. You know. And then they would look into it. And then they would find out they had to deal with Michael Mann, and everybody would just walk away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one wants to deal with this guy. <laughs> well, well, the well. Yeah, I'll say the graphic novels are popular now to, uh, to make into uh, and make into films. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, 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 but I did it just because right. I, want, I want to show... If I had done the screenplay and been in charge, this is what you would have seen. Mm -hmm. I've read that you're uh, a fan of EC Comics. Um, there, would you ever want to do more comic books besides like the, the one graphic novel? Oh, um, Tom Montalioni and I have been shopping around a uh, a series of graphic novels. Um, it's been in and out of different uh, different companies. No one will turn it down. But no one will make an offer. Um, so, but I, I don't know, it, it, it's kind of highbrow, it has a lot to do with epistemology and things like that, so maybe maybe it's, it's, it's not right, but, you know, I, 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 it's a story I would love to tell, but, um, you know, you, you need someone to, to make it worth your while, because uh, you can't write it for nothing. Right. right. I, I think that would be great, though. I'd love to see, like, like an F. Paul Wilson, Bernie Wrights in collaboration. Oh, I mean, I would, too. He's one of my favorite artists. Yeah. And um, it, 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 it's, it's very strange in, in, in this business that, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was at Dave Scow's house, and um, he was having a little party, and, and I find myself standing next to Bernie Wrights, who I'd never met, and... Uh, it, it was it was really cool to just to be uh, to be able to talk to a guy that whose art I've seen and he's really you know well everybody really is a regular guy you know if you get them in the right you know circumstances and you know he so he wasn't being Bernie Wrights and the artist he was just being the guy at a party and so it was, it was, it was great. Uh, you mentioned pelts. What was your uh, opinion on the final um, the final product? Um. Of the Masters of War. Well, you know, it was in, in the long run, it was true to the the sense of the story. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was it was far more gory than that story, and it, it, it mm-hmm. is the goriest story I have ever written. <laughs> um, and the Matt Vain screenplay was um, pretty close to the, to the story. He had to pad it out with that uh, that lady in the woods to, mm-hmm. to bring it up to fifty five minutes, um, and then. Gario got a hold of it, and he really upped the gore factor. And my big thing, and uh, Gario and I rode back and forth to the uh, the remote, you know, the, the site, the, the farmhouse site, in, in the same car. And he doesn't speak much English, and he had a translator with him, so it was, it was hard to really get across to him. But you know, I I kept pounding on the fact that in the story, nobody gets what they want. You know, the 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 trappers don't get the money they thought they'd get. Um, Jake doesn't get the girl. Um, nobody gets what they want. And in his version of, of the screenplay, Jake gets what he mm-hmm. wants. And, and I say, well, look, we both can have what we want here. You know, um, Jake can, can think he's, he's going to get Shanna, and at the very last moment, you know, he goes limp. He says, I've wanted this for so long, and here it is. I can't get it. <laughs> that would be really frustrating, and I thought that would be kind of cool. Right. You know, Jake wanted, I mean, Dario wanted Jake to get Shanna in that particular way, and so mm, he did. Right. Are you happy with um, with uh, Meatloaf in the movie, or in the TV show? Yeah, yeah. Um I, at first I said meatloaf. I mean, he can This is supposed to be a, like a Jewish guy, you know. That, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't see. I don't see you know meatloaf playing this uh, New York furrier. You know? mm-hmm. Right, right. But he was. He was. I. I just thought he was good. And um, when I wasn't riding around with Dario, I was riding around with meatloaf. And um, <laughs> you know, you know, he's just. He's just sort of this icon, you know, with, with you know, bad out of hell and all that. Mm-hmm. And you're riding around with him, and he's got to have Diet Coke. And <laughs> he sends the driver on this quest, you know, in the world or in the car. We have to have, he has to have Diet Coke. And so finally, we find this little, this little Canadian Vancouver strip mall. And I mean, it's really pathetic. And he's out there wandering up and down in his his raincoat, looking for Diet Coke. And I'm saying to the driver, I'm saying, it's like it's like being with your eccentric uncle <laughs> who has to have Diet Coke. And he found some, and he was the happiest can be, you know. And then he would take it to his trailer, and in between the takes, he'd go back to his trailer and drink his Diet Coke. You expect you know, meatloaf. He's going to be snorting cocaine. He's going to be doing this <laughs> right. all stuff. No, 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 no. He's hooked on diet coke. <laughs> I kind of ruins my like, you know, my fantasy of the guy. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way it is. <laughs> any interaction uh, with uh, John Saxton on the shoot? No, I only, I only met him in makeup. You know, mm-hmm. he was in makeup. You know, I just said a few words to him. That was it. Because. As I was leaving, I could only stay about three days. I, that's all I could, uh, time I could afford away. And so his parts um, were coming up toward the end of the of, of the location shoot. After that, I, when I got there, I had this you know, email, not email, um, voicemail on my hotel phone from Mick Garris saying, oh, you know, we're shooting the strip club scenes. You know, we're right around the corner from the hotel, so come on, you know. Give me a buzz, and we'll go over there, and we'll we'll you know, we'll watch the strip club scene. So of course, you know, I broke my finger dialing, and I, <laughs> he didn't he didn't answer, and I couldn't get a hold of him. And finally, the next day, he said, "Oh," he said, "Yeah, well, we finished them before you came." <laughs> so I really would have loved to go and see them, but um, timing is everything, as they say. Uh, someone here in our chat room, uh, as moral. Um, do you have any? Oh, Tony! I know oh, you know Tony. that person. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have he's, any? He's, he's one of our uh, our original website guys. Oh, cool. Uh, I want to know: Do you have, uh, as a writer, do you have any rituals, 
like keep certain items at your desk while writing? Uh, mm, not really. I mean, I, I get up early. I have my coffee. I bring it up to my desk. I go to the website. I go to the uh, the email related to the site. I go to my personal email. I go to astronomy picture of the day. I go to overheard New York. And then uh, start writing once all that's out of the way. Okay. And, of course, you have uh, withthoughtyourhead.com open on the... Uh... <laughs> oh, yes. And, yeah. and uh, ever since I heard of you guys recently, yes, that's right there, too. Yes, of course. Did you have a question there? Yeah, I hadn't heard of oh. you guys, so you contacted me. Oh, okay. Well, we've yeah, only been doing it about a year. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Troy, is the uh, he does all the artwork on the site. That was pretty good. I, li- I like my picture there. All right, as long as you like the card, too, that's all of that. All the stuff is coming out of my card card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. Did you have a question there, Troy? Um, uh, actually, um, he wants to know where you came up with the idea for the Rakosh. Um, well, I, it's not really my idea. Um, the Rakoshi is uh, a, a, a variation of the, uh, the Rakshasa, which is an a, a Indian demon, mm-hmm. and... Uh, I came up, I mean, I, I was looking for something. And this is back in the days. This is We're talking the early 80s. And I wanted, well, I'd had a dream where I was on a rooftop and there was something chasing me. And no matter what I did, I couldn't escape it. Even if I fooled it into jumping over the edge, it would climb back up. It was, I mean, nothing I could do could defeat it. And I woke up in a, in a sweat and I said, you know, man, i got to use this is this is nerve wracking, and so I had to come up with a hero who could survive that, which turned out to be Jack. But the other thing I said, "What the heck was this thing?" Because it really had no identity uh, in the dream, and so I, I searched high and low for something that no one had ever heard of, and or very few people had, you know, had ever heard of, mm-hmm. and. Um, and this is the day, this is long before Google. This is, you know, going into libraries and, and, sh- and you know, flipping through those little cards. And I finally came, found this thing called the Demons of Rajpur by the, the Bang Sisters. And it was really, it was Bengali. I think the Bengali uh, version of the Rakshasa was Rakashi. And... Um, Rakash, actually, I made the plural into Rakashi. That was my own thing. But um, the Rakash was their version of the Rakshasa, and so I said, "Oh, this is great." Hardly anybody's ever heard of this. They were shape shifting demons, and I said, "I don't want to get into shape shifting, so I'll just you know forget about that," because mm-hmm. uh, that was a can of worms I did not want to open. And so that I, I came up from the, the it was actually the Bang Sisters book that put me onto this. And in my mind, the Rakashi, my Rakashi, are the real world inspiration. You know, I mean, all myths spring from something. Mm-hmm. Well, the Rakshasa myth, uh, Indian, Indian Rakshasa myth, uh, sprang from the Rakash. Oh, that's the way I look at it. Well, the only want... time I had ever heard of them was in Dungeons and Dragons. That was like <laughs> the, the only place I had heard of them. Yeah, but that was, I bet you that was after 1984. Mm. Yep. I will guarantee you it was after 1984. <laughs> no one had heard of them. Not even me. <laughs> well, one of our fans asked about Dungeons & Dragons, uh, the Gibbering Mouther. You wouldn't know if you were a Dungeons & Dragons fan. And would you consider a role-playing system inspired by your works? Well, you know, there was a... Uh, Mayfair Games put out a, a role-playing game of the Keep. Oh, yeah. And... Yeah, it was licensed from uh, uh, Paramount back in 80, 83, 84. Uh, Bill Fawcett uh, uh, designed it, and it was, you know, I wasn't really into the role-playing uh, board games, mm-hmm. but the people who were, like Matt Costello, who I did a lot of work with, he said it was a damn good game. And he said it was, and I looked through the book, you know, the background, I said, man, this guy has done his homework. It was really, really good. 
And um, so I, uh, then you know, Mayfair wanted to renew the license, and, and um, Paramount wanted so much, you know, ridiculous amount that Mayfair said, you know, I mean, this is this movie, this movie flopped, and uh, you know, the game did okay, but you know, it didn't do that. Well, then mm-hmm. we're going to pay, you know, like a twenty thousand dollar licensing fee for this thing again. So um, they went out of print. But it's you know, everyone who who's into that type of thing really liked it. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to eBay. Repairman Jack, I can't license <laughs> something like that because Beacon Films owns the uh, game rights. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Hideo uh, Kojima. Uh, is a big Repairman Jack fan. He wants to do the game based on the movie. All uh, but he's just waiting for the script. Mm-hmm. Do you have another uh, question there, Troy? Um. Well, can can you tell us who's playing Abe in the movie, or you can't tell us like any <laughs> of the actors? <laughs> well, no. The thing is, they've got to get the star. Oh, okay. And, so that's um, the first one. That that's number one. And once he's done, um. You know, then they go for the director, and after that, then they, they'll go for the rest of the cast. But uh, you know, Jack has to be signed, and I hope you know it will be in, you know sometime in, in May. Um, you know, but I've seen I've seen negotiations with you know lawyers and agents go on forever. So I just I I think it, it's going to be a good move for this guy to. to Play Jack, so I'm, I'm hoping you know they don't really you know, make a big deal out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of our fans, Susie, wants to know why is Jack in Nightworld ignorant of things he should know about from his adventures in the Repairman Jack books? Susie, yes, that's what it is. Yes. Well, Susie, uh, Nightworld was written in like '92, and the second Repairman Jack novel was written in '97. So I had no intention of writing more in repayment jack novels when I wrote that um, so that's why because I had it, it, it wasn't planned however the uh, revised night world which is available for an exorbitant price from uh, uh, borderlands press is brought up to date and you know Jack knows all the things he should know in that one but well, that's what happens when you write the end of a series before you finish writing the series, because you had no idea you were going to write a series. <laughs> right. This is the kind of, this is what we deal with. Mm-hmm. Uh, As Morrow also wants to know. Um, uh, by, by the way, someone's trying to call him with uh, an unknown number. We cannot take those. If uh, you want to call him, it's five zero eight six four four eight five zero three. Once the Jack franchise runs its course, are there any other franchise characters you'd like to go back and revisit? Maybe a key prequel. <laughs> this is an ongoing question on the website. They, they, like, they, they love to bug me with this to keep prequel. Um, yes, I would love to do a keep prequel, but um, I, I I have to finish the Jack novel first. And uh, though I would love to flesh in, uh, right now I'm doing a young adult uh, series of of Pearman Jack as a teenager. Before he really knows, you know, he really learned his stuff, and he's just feeling his way and, and starting to learn how to do these fixes. And um, I, I first one, and my the editor there loves it, and I absolutely love it. And I um, I can't wait till it comes out. And but there's also the there's the period between the time Jack arrived in New York and the tomb and you know, how he learns the ropes and all that kind of stuff. So, that, you know, there's a lot of possibilities out there. I don't know if we're going to live long enough to write them, but, it's, you know, I, I figured I have about four or five more books before Night World. And then, you know, I'm not going to drag this on forever because, um, you know, it, it's not an open-ended series. And I, I don't want to drag it into dirt. You've all read series where... You know, the author has just kept the character going too long. I think, as much as I like Spencer, you know, I think Robert Parker has just taken him too long. And it's just, you know, let him go. Let him go. 
stop repeating yourself. Stop trying to rewrite, you know, the, the Magnificent Seven. Just let it go. Just say goodbye. Uh, you another caller here? Who is this? Yeah, my name's Ken. All right, you're on there with uh, F. Paul Wilson. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, he wrote a book called Healer, and it started two people. Uh, one was a symbiote that actually uh, connected with the human, but that was a uh, part of an adult. And uh, they ended up going... Uh, you know what? I, I, hate to inter- I hate to interrupt you, but I'm really having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, is, can you speak up, please? Yes, I'm sorry. Is no problem. Better? Okay. Um, I was just curious, because they lived to, for so long. Hey, did he ever plan on writing another book about Dalton Pard? Because he kind of left it a little bit open-ended. I mean, that they would just keep living on. I was just curious if he was at, had ever planned on writing a, another book on that one. Yeah, he's referring to um, some of the first fiction I published back in the 70s. Um, I had two characters. And it, the first novel was called Healer, and it was two characters. One was a human being, and the other was sort of a parasite that seeped into his brain and didn't take over his body in the, in the sense that he controlled him, but out of pure self-interest, this creature, which my guy named Pard, because they became partners, um, out of pure self-interest, he kept uh, the human being alive by being conscious down to the cell, cellular level and when anything went wrong in the cell like a mutation began it would have turned into a tumor he killed it and he fixed this and he fixed that so in, in a sense the human became his name was Stephen Dalt he became immortal um, and I thought maybe I'd carried that as far as I could go I um I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever revisit that. I mean, it, unless I come up with an idea that's really worthy, it, it's not something that I, I just don't like. I mean, people want me to go back to those guys, and I had a lot of fun with them. But unless I can do something that's really going to take it into you know new territory, I don't want to keep rehashing the whole you know the same thing over and over again. Well, that's true. I appreciate your time. Uh, and you and you know and. and uh, and that's not going to do any. I'm not going to do anything for you either as a reader. If I if I sort of drag a character down just to write another story about him, so it, it, it's. And that's why Jack. You know, I, I, I'm not going to keep Jack going forever. I'm, I'm going to just let that series stop. And because I'm very proud of it, and I'm very proud of that whole adversary cycle thing, I do not want to sully it with something that I'm doing just to do another book. Right. And I also understand that you always write books because you felt like you have the, the feel the need to write them at that time, too. So I was just wondering yeah. if you were thinking of so. Yeah, that's been a problem, if, I, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct about what you're talking about, for me, is career-wise, is um, I, you know, I made a point of writing the next book, right. no matter what it was. And that, you know... And anybody who's out there who's a writer um, with a career will understand what I'm saying when I say that's not always the best thing to do, uh, market-wise. Right, they had a hard time classifying you. Exactly. And probably if I go back, there were certain books I would do under another name uh, because they just didn't fit into the cycle of, you know, what people were expecting of me, right. and and I think that would have yeah you know, that would be better for my career that way. But you know, I've done okay, and so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know moan about it. But you know, there are career choices you can make nowadays. I was just talking to a young author to no oh, was it yesterday, and just saying that you know she's got this. Um, Sort of a, a horror novel that, that that a couple of publishers are interested in, which is a nice place to be if yeah. you're an author. <laughs> and but she also wants to do this mystery series, and it's an interesting concept on in the mystery series. But I said, you know, it may not be a good idea to put the same name on both of those because you know, mystery writers don't necessarily like you know, the supernatural or the 
that type of horror, and the horror writers don't like the uh, the cozy type mysteries. And so she's a versatile writer, and I think she can she can do both. But you know, and I said talk to your agent about it. But you know, this is my advice: is do them under different names. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks for calling, in, Ken. Do you have anything else? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Just tell right. my, I'll tell them high on the board. All right. Thanks for calling, man. <laughs> Thanks for calling, yeah. yeah. Uh, someone here in the chat room required, uh, they want to know, will the revised AC be released in paperback? Eventually, yes. Um, the thing is, it has to be timed right. Um, the touch, or I mean the keep and the tomb are already out. The touch can probably be fit in there anyway. Um, we wouldn't would follow the touch, but I would hold off on reprisal because reprisal will be right before the last Jack novel, which will lead into Night World. So, you know, things happen in reprisal, which will trigger the final events that trigger Night World. So there'll be one repairman Jack novel between reprisal and Night World, and I'd like to get the timing right. So I've been holding back and reprinting Mm -hmm. those books. Uh, when you earlier when you talked about uh, researching stuff about the Rikoshi, um, is that something you would recommend to writers instead of uh, like recycling the same things like you, the vampires and werewolves and uh, zombies to go back and maybe try to find some other kind of uh, creature you could write about? Some well, kind of legend. That, there's that. I mean, I I want an historical perspective, so that's why I went looking for what I did. You're much better making up something. Mm-hmm. Um, like, as I said, this writer I was talking to yesterday, she she's come up with something completely different and completely creepy. And it's, it's not based on anything. That, you know, vampires, werewolves, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it, it's not terribly complicated. But the thing is, um... I haven't seen it before, and because of that, I would, that made the book fascinating to me. And that, you know, that's got me behind it. That's why I gave it a blurb and stuff like that. I don't do that that often. But it was, it, it, thinking about it now, it still creeps me out. This, this little, it, it turns out to, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a little, little girl. It's a, a dirty little girl in a dirty dress, and she's, she's completely evil. And no one else can see her except this uh, character. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's very chilling. So, I mean, make up something. I mean, that's what this is all about, is making things up. Um, so many writers, you know, write one book, and then that's it. You know, mm-hmm. they, they never really write another one of, of any value. And that's because they've drawn on their own experience. And drawing on your own experience is fine to a degree, but the thing is, you know, you got to make shit up. You can't just, um, you can't just rely on your experience. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have two books in your whole life, and then you're going to use up your experience. And then what are you going to do? You're going to be it. That's going to be it. <laughs> so, um, I think the writers with the long track record are not the ones. Who, who write completely from experience are the ones who make stuff up. Mm-hmm. And then if you make stuff up, you can go on and on and on. If you don't, if you you, you depend on your experience, you know, you're going to run out of experience. And, you know, Unless you've lived stop. a very bizarre life. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, speaking of that, uh, Knight Rider, he wants to know, what are your thoughts on Stephen King? Stephen King? Mm-hmm. Um... I just saw him at the Mystery Writers uh, Awards Banquet, um, and we we show you know we know each other, but we're not we're not friends. Um, I don't have his his home phone number, and <laughs> he doesn't have mine. But um, he looks terrible. <laughs> uh, I say that you know I mean it just he is so so thin and and. Wasted looking. I'm saying, you know, can I buy you a steak or something? Just, you you got to eat, man. And uh, but um, I liked his early stuff an awful lot. Mm-hmm. 
one of my favorite novels of all time, and it will never stop being one of my favorite novels, is Tale and Fly. And, um, but, you know, it, it's very uneven. I, I, I like his shorter works. I, I think he, you know, chews a lot more than he bites off. And my my favorite works of his are like Misery and uh, Dolores Claiborne and things like that. That you know, he's really tight, he's really focused, and he's not doing all this digressive stuff. You know, going off in these tangents. And um, but you know, that's my taste. I do not like. I mean, I like fiction that is focused and you know has a real narrative drive to it. I mean. I mean, that's what I try to write, and that's you know that's what I uh, that's what I like to read, and I and I think authors should should write what they like to read. So that's where you know that's where I'm coming from. So I don't like the bookstop books, you know, the doorstop books. I like uh, I like the, the more focused books. Uh, Rogue wants to know: Was it a big decision on your part to give up your medical uh, practice full time to become a writer? Um, no. Um, at that time, I was making more money, far more money writing than I was in medicine. So the financial, there was no financial constraint. Um, and as for, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, you put up your hands and do that scale thing and you say, oh, okay, uh, here I am making more money. What do I choose? More money. And my own schedule, or on the other hand, uh, malpractice right. and all that, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's a, oh, gee, this is a tough choice. But it really, of course, it isn't. But I, you know, the thing is, I couldn't give it up 100%. I mean, I, uh, there's a certain part of me that uh, I spent an awful part of, my, a big part of my life was invested. In, in medicine, and you know, in family practice, there's this precious thing where people really trust you. They want to. I mean, kids I I saw as infants are now bringing their kids to me. I mean, there's a continuity there that is so precious um, that. I, can't, I really had trouble giving it up uh, completely, and there were days. There were days when I say, "Jesus Christ, why am I doing this?" Um, and there, were, but there are other days where I walk out of the office saying, you know, "Oh, this was great. I had a great day, and uh, I did some good." And that's one of the things that you know that that medicine offers is that you can walk out of the office at the end of the day and say, "You know, I did something good." When you're doing writing, you say, did, you know, did I did I make a difference in anybody's life by writing this this, this wonderful prose? And all my prose is wonderful. But it, did I did I make a difference in anybody's life? You know, and you can't say. I mean, I mean, I had I've had people. You know, somebody brought up my uh, my science fiction from the 70s, and my my novel, An Enemy of the State. I mean, I had more than one person come up to me and say, you changed my life with that book and which I hate to hear because in the old Chinese proverbs I'm now responsible for that person's life but in 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 reality you know in writing you, you can't get that on a day to day basis on a day to day basis you, you, you get your page count done I mean I do three a minimum of three pages a day and that's how I keep up my output but um in medicine, I can walk out that door, as I said, and say, you know, I did good. I done you done good, kid, and that type of thing. <laughs> Do you ever use any of your uh, knowledge as uh, your medical knowledge in your uh, books? Oh yeah, all the time. Um, it's been a great help. I try, you know, I, at first I refused to write, you know, medical thrillers or anything like that because that would be like, you know, staying at work. All right. And. You know, writing was my golf game. You know, if doctors, you know, have to, you know, have the cliche of the, the golf playing doctor. Well, you know, that was my golf game was was playing, you know, playing with the typewriter and the, and the computer. And so, I tried to write as far away from medicine as I could. 
But strangely enough, the, you know, the, the biggest advance I ever had in my life turned out to be a medical thriller I wrote under. And this goes back to what I, I said to that young writer, is I'd written it under another name. And by doing that, the, you know, the publishers did not bring any of the baggage of my horror novels to this, because this was a different genre. And they just looked at this as the book itself. And they <laughs> they threw a lot of money at it. So that's sort of been the case by my uh, position there. Uh, someone else want to know, uh, why do a lot of your stories take place in the Pine Barrens? Because it's one of the most fascinating places on Earth. And then the young adult, the Jack Ballows, because he grows up on the edge of the Pine Barrens, really feature, really exploit the, the mystery of the Pine Barrens. And, um, I mean, it, it, it's, a million, it's a million acres. Um, oh, two million acres, acres and something like a thousand square miles, whatever. But it's a hu- this huge expanse of wilderness right off the northeast corridor. And there are places there that no human being has laid eyes on. So it's full of mystery. You know, they have the you have the pineys who are inbred. Um, you have the the legend of the Jersey Devil. And really you have these hunters who walk in there every every uh hunting season and are never seen again. So what happened to them? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, really what happened to them is it was an overcast day. They couldn't see the sun. They had no idea which was north or south. They wandered around in circles and starved to death or got dehydrated or whatever. So that's probably what, that, that's what. Right. Rationally, that's what you think would happen. But I always think that the Jersey Devil got it. <laughs> there's also an excellent, uh, yeah, there's also an excellent um, episode of uh, Sopranos. Right. I mean, <laughs> people realize we still don't know what happened to that Russian guy. Yeah, but people know. If people who know New Jersey realized this, and unfortunately there was a lot of toxic dumping in there, which again, it's a great story fodder. But it is the the largest pure freshwater uh, aquifer in the Northeast because all the water in the pines flows out of the pines. So it's pure, pure water. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though it might be colored brown from the cedars and stuff like that, that's just pigment. The, the water is pure. And uh, Wharton State Park exists because, you know, Wharton, the big Philadelphia billionaire, uh, bought up all this, this, this uh, pine land to, to funnel the water into Philadelphia. He's going to sell it to Philadelphia. And Jersey became long and said, no, you're not. <laughs> and so the, the land became, you know, worthless. And so he turned it into a state park. Uh, as Moral has another question here. Uh, tell us about Virgin finally being released under your own name. Well, Virgin was, actually, this is one of the, you know, again, writing things under another name. That medical thriller I mentioned a little while ago, mm-hmm. um, that was in the the offing as, you know, it's it just about to come out. And I, once again, I wrote the next book, and the next book was this strange religious thriller about discovering the body of the Virgin Mary and, uh, around the millennium and, and what happened. Um, totally unlike, I mean, it just, it was, it was out of left field, especially in regard to the... Um, you know, the medical thriller, and I just said to my agent, I said, you know, I can't put this out there, because people who read the select, and they, if they see the virgin, and see virgin, they pick it up, and I say, ah, what is this? What's this guy thinking? This is not what I thought it would be. So, I, I put it under my wife's maiden name, Mary Elizabeth Murphy, and um, I blurbed it on the cover, and I dedicated it to myself. You know, I, I put... Um, you know, was it? Uh, I dedicate yeah to my husband, without whom this book would not have been possible. So it was, uh, and, it, and it was a paperback original. 
and it uh, you know, it's, it, it, it sold whatever it had out there and, and disappeared. And so now, you know, it's finally this other publisher, the small press, has put it out as a... Um, that's re- I, I, I really like the book. You don't have to be religious, because I'm, I'm, I'm a devout agnostic. And But the thing is, if I can write about vampires being real, like I did in Midnight Mass, if I can, I can write about this woman being the mother of, you know, the son of God. Right. Why not? I, I, I just, you just take... You take the premises, you buy into them, and just run with the story. And so, um, and I had great fun. I mean, I have a Catholic upbringing. I, I'm, I'm, re- I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> it's, um, well, John's a Catholic here. <laughs> oh, really? Is he recovering or is he real? I think he's real. Real? Well, I'm recovering. Uh, I had a Jesuit education. They taught me how to think, and I thought my way out of the church. So... Um, but the thing is, I used, you know, all that, the stuff, if you go to Catholic school and you're raised a Catholic, things are imprinted in you. Um, images are imprinted in you. And I, you know, mo- most of us recovering Catholics can't get rid of them. So, I, you know, I, I put them to use in this story. And, I mean, I had a wonderful time with it, and I, and I, I, I just loved the book. I, re- I look back on it and I, re- I, I reread it for the Borderlands edition, and I said, yeah, I took it out of the millennial type of thing, but I really liked this book, and I was really happy to have it back in print. But I said, why not? You know, put it in my own name, and now they just um, they did an expensive limited edition. But they now put it out in, in a, a paperback for sixteen ninety five, and you know the more people who read it, the better. I mean, I, I just 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 go into it, and it's it's a religious thriller that's really anti religion. <laughs> and at the end, I <laughs> I really do a number on religions at the end, as far as you know, physically and and uh, philosophically. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so no matter what, you know, whether you're Muslim or or you're a Buddhist or whatever, I think there, there's something in there for you. Yeah. Did you have another question there? Tro- uh, did you have something to say, Troy? Oh, uh, um, I was wondering uh, why you always write like the best villains in your books. How do you do? Well, that? thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you always have the most interesting, and like they're all so different. They're all so varied. Well. I go, I, I, I start with the premise that nobody's all good and nobody's all bad. And so I, my heroes always have warts. I mean, there was some reviewer who just who reviewed the next Repairman Jack book. Um, the limited edition is out, uh, I guess, this month, but the, the trade edition won't be out until October. But he reviewed the, the limited edition. And, you know, Jack has, Jack has a beer, Repairman Jack has a beer stop. And, and he took him to task for that. Because, he said, well, he, you know, Jack is this, this person, this idealized type of thing for, um, libertarians and so on, and he should have this, you know, I don't know, he should, he shouldn't be, uh, judge someone by their taste in beer. Mm-hmm. And, the thing is, he's human. He he has he hates Budweiser, and he hates Bud Light, and he and he really has no respect for people who drink it. And so, is that is that right? Is that fair? No, but that's the way he is. And this guy couldn't get it. That you know, he, he thinks you know a character should you know personalize, personify an ideal, and I say no. A character is a human being, and we all have our prejudices. We all have our predilections, and so so go with it. That's the way people are. So I do the same thing with villains. Villains, they do bad things, but you know what? They're not all bad. They, they may still love their mother. They may still love their cousin. They may go out of their way 
to, to their sister has Alzheimer's and they may go and sit with their sister and then go out and kill somebody. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, you give them that other dimension that, you know, even, you know, I mean, who is, Hannibal Lecter is, is almost attractive for the purity of his evil. <laughs> but the thing is, he has a sense of honor. And really, Hannibal Lecter is, is drawn from Dr. Fu Manchu. And most people do not realize this, and most people don't know Dr. Fu Manchu. But the thing is, Fu Manchu was this, what we call a yellow peril, back in the, uh, the days of the pulps, when everybody feared all these Orientals, which they weren't called Asians, Asians they were right. called Orientals, um, were streaming into America, and they thought, well, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to take over. They, they, they've got some plot behind them, and so Sachs Romer invented Fu Manchu, who was the, you know, the epitome of of, of, the, of that kind of fear. Um, but he gave him, he made him honorable. Fu Manchu would put, you know, a horrible millipede in your bed, to, you know, a poisonous snake or whatever to kill you, you know, or a poison dart or whatever. But the thing was, if he gave his word, if he said, okay, you can go, you know, you know, we we reached a deal, you can go, you could turn his back on him and, and walk away because he had that old world sense of honor. You know, that by breaking his word, he would diminish himself. And so that sense of honor, you know, raises him in in the villain world. And that's the type of thing I always think of. There's got to be, and, and, and a lot of my villains are not honorable. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, they have a human side to them that, that, you know, they love their dog, they love their mom, or whatever. And when you when you do that, that's why you know someone's asking me this question: Why are my villains villains so interesting? Mm-hmm. And that's why because they're people. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, someone here just in our chat room made a comment. They said, uh, "Rassel Rasselam is the best villain of all time, better than Darth Vader." Um, I don't know. <laughs> Darth Vader's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gonna give it up to Darth Vader. Ross Lama is, yeah. Again, look at Darth Vader. Look at Darth Vader. Complex character. He has a good side. He wasn't the bad person we started off with. He became a bad person, and then, you know, he could have, you know, he, he could not let his son die. And so, I mean, that's that conflict, that yin and yang within people. Um, Roslam, to tell you the truth, I I don't think... Roslam is is pretty much pure evil. He has given himself over to the dark side. He really doesn't have a... I don't think he has a good bone in his body. I'm writing about him now in the next book, and I don't think... I can't find anything good about him. No, not really redeemable qualities there. He's sort of evil personified, but he is, he is, he has, has aligned himself with something that's completely inimical to everything that, you know, humans like. And so, he may have his weaknesses, but they're not because he's good. Uh, so I've, Ra- just, I've just contradicted everything <laughs> I just <laughs> said. <laughs> All right. Uh, Raul Duke, he wants to know, uh, well, first he says, great interview, his uh, favorite without your head show so far. Well, thank him. And uh, he wants to know, where was this question here? Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring writers? Well, the first advice is keep your day job. <laughs> the second, you know, next is write every single day. And... The third thing is, I would say, I mean, I mean, keep. You, sometimes you need, and a lot of times you you need instruction. So I mean, if there are workshops and things like that, you should you should go to them, and not so much. You should go to the. I mean, like, I'm sounding like an idiot here. 
Um, the first thing is, if you, if you if you need some help, if you think you you need to to work on on your writing, I mean, a lot of times these workshops, the little workshops are not good because you've got a lot of other people who are at your level of writing criticizing your writing, mm -hmm. and I've seen that what's happened with that, and a lot of times it will wear you down and a lot of times kill your enthusiasm. Um, I teach at the, the Borderlands Boot Camp every year, and but we're all professional writers and we're and we're instructing non-professional writers, and so what we give you is not. We're not. We, we don't care to put you down to bring ourselves up. All we want to do is improve what you've got there, and so we have no agenda other than making you a better writer. Uh, if you can, if you can find things like that, that's going to be beyond value to you. But if you if you're going to be, you, know, you got to watch out for getting into workshops where uh, the other members just want to put you down because you might be better than them, and they're going to try to find any way to put you down. I mean, and 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 writers are just as venal as other people. I mean, sometimes they're very supportive, but there's always somebody there who uh, wants to hammer you down because, my God, you know, you've written something that they couldn't do. But writing every day is, is the most important thing. And shutting off other other thoughts it, 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 it can be tough, but, I mean, if you're a writer and you're a part-time writer, you've got a day job, and you're... And, you have limited writing time. I mean, don't spend your time in the car, you know, listening to music, or with your iPod, you know, earbuds in your ears. Right. Shut all that stuff off. Start thinking about what you're going to be writing when you finally do get to the keyboard. And when you do that, man, it's going to fly out of you, and you'll make the most of that type of uh, of, of your time. But I mean, these people. I mean, I I look around. I see people that are constantly being entertained. They got to have the radio on. They got to have their iPod. They got to have this and that. But you know, if you're going to be a writer, you're going to be wanting to entertain people. So you got to shut off those other voices and have your own in your head and figure all this stuff out. Uh -huh. uh, so turn off turn off the outside world and just listen to yourself. Uh, any plans of doing another uh, freak show collection? No, I'm not. <laughs> that was a quick answer. The, the, <laughs> I, I was vacillating there. Um, no, I'm never going to do another anthology. Okay. Um, I, uh, but I am. I have taken all my freak show, um, the interstitial material from freak show. And I put it all together, and then I expanded it to to another fifty percent of what it started with, and it's going to be coming out from a small press very soon. I, you know, uh, the small press and I have kept this under wraps until it's ready for pre-order, and we I think we've just the the editor publisher is I think he has an obsessive compulsive disorder because he has found every possible error in the manuscript and every possible error has been corrected so when this comes out it will be you know freaking perfect <laughs> so, and then he can get back on his medications and <laughs> uh, is there anything you want to uh, tell your readers out there uh, nothing I mean the thing is if, if you go to the website and you get in the newsletter right you know everything hear I know <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, or you can go to the web, you can go to the website and the news page and you know everything, everything you'd, you'd ever, there's more than you'd ever want to know there from the the FAQ downloads and the bibliography downloads and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, what can I say? I, I mean, just you know, buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a good message for everybody out there. Buy the men's right. books. Right. <laughs> well, we, we uh, really appreciate you coming on tonight. It was fun. It was a good interview and uh, some interesting questions. Uh, you know, I haven't 
been uh, thrown at me for a while. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. Okay. My pleasure. This is Danny Trejo, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Keep listening, or I'll take your head.